And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Dr. Mark Halpern, chiropractor, author, and lecturer. Despite being a successful chiropractor and someone who excelled at sports, he was actually suffering from crippling anxiety on the inside. He was able to reduce or eliminate the anxiety of 30 years, and today we're going to learn about how he did it and how he can help you too. Dr. Mark, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right. I guess we should just start at the beginning. And if you don't mind, tell us about your anxiety and how you were able to help yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, I've just turned 50 uh, last uh, last year, and I really have been de- dealing with anxiety probably since about the age of uh, 12, sometime in grade six or seven. And I don't think I really had an unusual background. I really did have a happy childhood Uh, I came from a good family. I had lots of friends. You know, on the surface, I was what I thought an emotionally well-rounded child. Uh, But I think starting in, you know, the grade six, grade seven time where you start getting into your puberty and and the high school years, I started developing insecurities and bad thinking habits. And that, you know, over time, over several years, instead of sort of nipping those bad thinking habits uh, in, in the bud, just they just kept happening and I kept going over and over and, and reacting in the same way and essentially developing triggers to many of life's insecurities with self-esteem and relationships and friends and all of sort of the, the um, what I would call common or normal things that teenagers go through. But, you know, when I was going through this in the 70s, uh, I guess in the 80s, um, there wasn't a lot of people talking about anxiety or uh, self-regulation or how kids could, you know, um, be helped with therapy or any of that. And I really didn't tell my parents. And so by the time I went through my early teens, by my late teens, I was already developing these really bad ruminating habits. My mind would race, it would create anxiety. And this pattern of thinking followed by anxiety, followed by more anxiety, and then this just pattern and triggers, they just kept um, cementing themselves. So that by the time I was in my 20s and you know, already in chiropractic college by the time I was 20, uh, you know, developing more solid relationships. Anxiety was really my base. Uh, I just remember I didn't get angry. I didn't get sad. I always just got anxious. My one emotional feeling that I had was this pit of anxiety that, you know, the only way I could describe is it's like I was going to go write my final exam or I was going to jump off a big cliff or, you know, the worst thing that you could imagine was about to happen. And you were going through that fight or flight response in your body where the body was under a, a tremendous amount of stress. And so I had to learn how to cope with normal everyday stressors as if they were urgent, you know, catastrophes. Um, And it was very difficult to make decisions, whether it was learning how to study under anxiety or have normal friendships or going out and doing social uh, into social gatherings. The backdrop was always anxiety. And so I took it upon myself being the type of person I was that I wanted to address this every possible way I could. There was nothing that I wasn't going to try to find the answer. And I always thought that if I tried everything, I would find the thing that would eventually solve my problem. You know, whether it was speaking to a therapist or doing cognitive behavioral therapy or trying medications or going to energy workers or trying new quantum healing methods, uh, homeopaths, naturopaths, chiropractors. I did everything Western-based, everything Eastern-based that I could get my hands on. And some things helped temporarily. Some things helped um, for, you know, greater periods of time. But I never found the answer. And so to me, it was always like, oh, I got to find the answer so I can finally live my life. I can finally live without anxiety. But that never happened. And it just years kept going by in my 20s and in my 30s. I got married. I had kids. You know, I was having a thriving practice. And on the surface, I just looked healthy and happy. And I was doing all these kinds of fun travels and, and, and sports adventures. But underlying it all was always the anxiety. And unless you were close to me, you really would not have known it. And so really years of trials and tribulations, uh, I had lots of things that worked and didn't work, but I kind of threw them on the heat pile and never really went back to them. 
And so to make sort of a long story short is in March of 2020, when the pandemic hit, we had just undergone a, um, a renovation in our clinic and I'm with a couple of other chiropractors. And uh, so we were March 15th, I'll never forget, we were supposed to come into work and it was going to be our first day in our new clinic. And when we all arrived, that was the day that we were told to go home, that we were shutting down, everybody was locking down for a couple of months. And I now had an undetermined amount of time to go home and twiddle my thumbs, essentially. And I just knew that that wasn't going to be very healthy or successful for me. And I knew that although I was doing far better in my daily life using some of the tools that I had, it wasn't going to be enough uh, if this uncertainty continued. And so what I did is I delved into everything that I had ever tried, every book, every method, every note, every journal, I went through it all. And as I did that, I went to revisit some of the books that I had read 10 years ago. And I had those little pieces of the corner of the book, you know, turned over that I was going to come back and revisit, but never did. And I went back and did everything. And that was really the beginning of the coherence revolution, because what I found was it was relevant, I, th I think, for people to know what worked, what didn't work. And I felt that finally, although I was, I was hesitant to write a book simply because I wasn't all better. I wasn't someone who never experienced anxiety anymore. And so I was always hesitant to write a book or, or create a, a course, but it finally kind of dawned on me that my trials and tribulations would benefit people. And in this time of uncertainty with how many people were suffering and overwhelmed and stressed out, that it would be very helpful for someone to see what did work for me and what didn't work for me and the things that I could, uh, I could advise. And so that was when the Coherence Revolution book started. I, I just wrote morning and night for months uh, in the spring of 2020. And by the summer, I had written the book and I had started the basics of this course, which is a six-week online course that goes through the materials of the book. And at the, at the heart of it, pun intended, um, is a technique called heart math. And heart math uh, is a technique that I'm certified in teaching. It's breath work using visualization, using emotion. And it's one of those tools that helps me self-regulate my emotions. And I have found it of everything that I've done, it's probably the most powerful thing that has given me back control over how I can regulate my own emotional response. And so I realized that it would be cool to teach people this technique, but I wanted to give people a better experience. And that's where I designed the course coherence revolution, where each week of the six weeks, you're diving in and learning these techniques of heart math, but we're also diving into our senses. We're also diving into nature and we're figuring out how you can use the world around you and your own body to create a state of what's called physiological coherence, which is when your body is in the zone, when you are feeling your best, when your digestion system is in, is in coherence, in other words, it's resonating with your breathing rhythm, with your heart rhythm, with your brain rhythm, when all the cells in your body are replicating properly and efficiently and using energy, that's coherence. And most of us know this state because, you know, athletes will say they're in the zone or someone will talk about being with a friend and they just connected and they talked for hours and they didn't realize the time had gone by. Well, they were in a state of coherence. Their, their, their natural body rhythms were in sync. And when someone eats a proper diet and when they're listening to music that makes their heart sing and when they're visualizing or looking at landscapes that make their body feel in tune with the world around them, that's coherence. You remember where you were at. <laughs> well, I, I mean, really, what, what I, was, I was sort of coming to a natural close of, of mm -hmm. the... Of, the, the way the coherence revolution and the, the book and the course came about. Um, and so by the, by the time that I had gone through this process and written everything down and created this course, um, it all just came together. And I, I had uh, along the way, um, you know, heart math, as I was saying, was a central part of this course and, and my learnings and how I self-regulate. And so as I was going through this course, you know, the universe sort of provides you what you need when you need it. And so I was, um, I was sort of tuning up on my ability to teach heart math as I was creating this course. And I just happened to run across someone online who um, was teaching heart math and he offered some teachers to be able to learn from him as well. Uh, and as I 
took his course a couple, for a couple of weeks. It turned out that he was the ex CEO of HeartMath and that he was the one who helped create this, uh, the, all the techniques in the company. And we resonated with each other. And so he came on board. And so now he's my partner with Coherence Revolution of trying to essentially get the word and the term and, and the knowledge about coherence, um, get it out there so that people understand there is a state that you can create in your own body and in your brain using your heart, using your breath, using visualization, and using the power of regenerative emotions. And that's really what this is all about is practicing the emotional state that you would like to be living in. Because without knowing it, what we all do is we practice a negative, stressful, emotional state. Because we think these thoughts, they create stressful chemicals in our brain. Our brain uh, then releases those chemicals. It creates anxiety in the body. And then that anxiety makes you think about those same thoughts again. And it's this pattern of over and over and over of creating these chemicals and then the thought process and then the body response of anxiety. And the idea is even though you don't think about it, you are practicing it because you're doing the same thing every day. And these patterns are just becoming more and more ingrained. And so if you can take a hold of this concept of, of emotional self-regulation and use tools such as heart math or some of the other techniques that I talk about in the course, what you're doing is you're literally practicing the emotional state and practicing the way you want to live so that it becomes more familiar to you and you start cementing new neurological programs and what your brain and body get used to is creating the positive uplifting emotions rather than the negative depleting emotions. Do you perform the heart math procedure during an actual anxiety attack, or is that just something you do daily to prevent it from happening? Both. Um, I tell patients and myself to practice heart math two or three or four times a day for two or three minutes without a stressful situation, because the idea is that you're trying to set, create a new set point for your emotional uh, health. You're trying to create a new set point for how your body is gets used to creating uh, an emotional response. However, it is an extremely powerful, I call it a superpower. If you're in the middle of a fight or flight response, any type of anxiety, and you start to use the breath work with the visualization, with the emotional response, um, you can shut down the, the fight or flight response in the moment, and you can start to choose your your emotional response and so yeah i mean your point is well taken this is something that you can be doing almost just like meditation which is what i do several times a day i just practice heart math because it feels good and it puts you in an, a good state but it has been very valuable to me because i don't tell people i've eliminated anxiety from my my life i still get anxiety i still have triggers that have been there for 30 years Except now, instead of a trigger setting me off and ruining my day or ruining my week, it might, it might affect me for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I can change my physiological state, and I can restart and get into a whole different zone. And so it is really powerful for people who, you know, I'm not looking to cure anything. What you're trying to do is create, a, establish a new um, emotional set point so that you still want to have access to all the range of emotions. You just want the positive emotions to be easier to achieve and something your body's familiar with creating. So basically the heart math is you're breathing in and out through your, maybe your chest, visualizing your heart and visualizing what? So it is less about the visualizing and it is more about the feeling. So I'll give, I'll give you a good example. Um, heart math consists of exercises and, uh, you know, breathing exercises that you don't need to read a book. You don't need to take a course. You don't need to do any of it. You could learn it on your own. However, HeartMath has books and they have biofeedback technology. And I have found both to be extremely beneficial because just the um, conscious learning of it, knowing, emo um, knowing consciously how to do it wasn't enough for me. I first started back in 2005. I read the book and I got the equipment and I did practice daily for a while. And I would say that I was able to get myself into a more calm state, but that's not really what uh, heart math is about is just getting into a calm state. It's about choosing your emotional response. And so I dropped it for five years probably, but somewhere around 2010, 2011, 
I remember I was sitting on my bed and I, I had a ear sensor on, which was measuring my heart rhythm. And so you can use their biofeedback and it tells you when you get into a coherent state, which involves the breathing, it involves visualization and it involves feeling an emotion. And so I remember sitting on my bed, closing my eyes and visualizing myself lying on a cloud, lying on a beach, uh, doing all the relaxing things I could think of. And nothing was changing. My physiological response, I was anxious. In fact, it was getting worse because I wasn't getting into coherence, which is something I try to teach people that, um, you know, you can't be sitting there reliant on getting in coherence because then you're just getting frustrated and it works against you. But I'm watching the, the technology and I'm not getting anywhere. And so I started thinking to myself, what can I do to really feel an emotion because nothing was working for me. And so I just determined in that moment, I'm not sure why, but I, I, I visualized my daughter, who was I think six or seven at the time, jumping into my arms and giving me a hug. And in that moment, I didn't just visualize the hug. I felt it. I felt her arms go around my waist. I felt the emotion that I feel when she gives me a hug. I felt the warmth and I truly felt her. And by feeling the emotion of the hug, I didn't need the technology to tell me what it was telling me because it went beep and the thing went to green. And what that meant is I was now in a physiological coherent state. I didn't need it. I felt it. I could feel it come over my body. And it was simply because when I felt the emotion with the breathing and with the visualization, that's when it helped. That's when it worked. And that was really my first time ever experiencing what I would call a coherent state. To me, before then, it was just a concept. It was something I was trying to do. I was faking it till I made it. And then once I experienced it and I thought, oh, that's what it feels like. You, I just felt driven. I felt uh, passionate. I felt uh, grateful. It, it just, everything came over me. And I thought, ah, that's what I've been chasing. That's the emotional response. And it wasn't from the visualization of it. It was from the feeling. And so that's the practice. And that's really what Coherence Revolution is about is less thinking, more feeling. And what can we do to get you to feel these things? And so, you know, when I dive into the senses, you know, there are smells in the, you know, that might in the morning make you feel uplifted for the day. And there might be a different smell at night that makes you feel relaxed. And the idea is for you to key in on those things and understand how to use the senses with things like heart math to start to create a physiological response in your body, right? Is your desk aimed at a window that's looking at uh, an electric field? Or do you, are you staring at a river or a mountain or a park? You know, what, what is your visual landscape on a daily basis? What are you listening to? Right? Are you, do you have the news in the background and just hearing the news stimulates a bit of a stress response? Or do you have some gentle music in the background that's just stimulating you to be creative? And so the idea is the course gives you six weeks to dive into each of the senses while you're learning these techniques of heart math. And so at the end of it, you want to have a toolbox of all the different things, whether it's tastes and smells and feelings and clothes and things that you can look at and things that you can listen to so that you start to design what I call a daily time schedule. And your daily time schedule isn't just filled with the things you want to do. It's filled with the emotions that you want to feel. And then the idea is for you to start practicing the emotions that you want to feel so that your life, the dream life that you're designing becomes more realistic to you, right? Because I use an example with people about going on vacation, no matter no matter what state you're in, most people dream of going on a vacation. So whether it's going and being in a hot tub on a resort, whether it's going and doing a weekend up north uh, with some friends, what you're visualizing is the emotional response you're going to have on this vacation. But the fact is, if you're stressed out, wherever you go, there you are. And so now you find yourself in the hot tub, you've gone all the way to the Caribbean, and you're sitting in the hot tub, and you're feeling the same emotion you did at home. And you're like, well, this isn't what I visualized. I'm still feeling stressed out and overwhelmed. So if you can start practicing the emotion that you want to feel before the vacation, 
not only will you start to feel that before the vacation, you're going to need that vacation a heck of a lot less simply because you're starting to feel those regenerative emotions that you envision that you're going to get on a vacation. And so the idea is that you start doing this fear your whole life and that every day you're consciously practicing this system that you've set up. So I call it a process mindset versus a destination mindset, right? Most of us have this destination in mind. For me, it was, I'm going to figure out what this anxiety is, and then I'm going to be able to live a happy life. But for most people, it's I'll be happy when, right? I'll be happy when I get a job, when I get a wife or a, or a husband, or when I get my, my dream job, or when I dr get my dream house, or when I go on that dream vacation. It's always, I'll be happy when. And then you realize that it's been 30 years and you've never been happy because you're always waiting for that thing to happen. So I believe you create a process, a daily process that you enjoy, that, it, that gives you inspiration, that, that perhaps you have goals that you'd like to achieve, but it's not about achieving the goal. It's about achieving your process every day. And if you fall off the bandwagon, you don't have to go and create anything. You just have to hop right back on your process that you've created and you're right back in the swing of things. So that, that's really, to me, what it's all about is having a toolbox and being able to create a life process that you can live by every day. And that's how you can start to manage your, your, self, your, you know, your, your own uh, emotional response. Have you found that the triggers that create anxiety for you, have they lessened or is there a new baseline for them or what? Yeah, yeah it's a good question. Um, I find there are some triggers that are gone. And there are some that now are momentary. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how many people have the same experience, but um, I was going through a divorce 10 years ago. And during that time, I would get emails from lawyers. And it got to the point that I didn't even have to open up the email. I was getting a stress response just from seeing the email in my inbox. And after... Mm -hmm several years of that, you develop a trigger, you know, an email shows up and now you feel anxiety. And so, you know, to this day, it's 10 or 11 years later, I don't have that same trigger anymore. But if it is an email that maybe I'm expecting from someone that um, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty around it, I might get a trigger that produces that anxiety. It's just now when I get it, I know what it's about. I'm conscious of it. And I can do any number of things to create more coherence in my body in that moment. Uh, and so it doesn't last. It's not a trigger that, that really upsets me. But I have lots of little triggers now that would still be there if I wasn't aware of catching them immediately and just having them dissipate using the tools that I have. Um, and there are some triggers that they just don't exist anymore simply because there's no, there's no need for it anymore. And my, I've either resolved it or uh, my life circumstances have completely changed. Um, but I do think some of these triggers are extremely powerful. Um, and that's really why I wanted to have a toolbox of things, because I don't know that I, I will eliminate every trigger I've ever had, but it, they're not relevant anymore in terms of my life. They're not relevant in terms of uh, having a, an effect on my overall day. You know, we have fight or flight because, you know, it's been around with us since maybe forever for just survival. But I feel like it's like fight or flight out of control where it's like now you can't either can't handle it or your brain's producing it even when it's really not in a situation of fight or flight. Do you think that underlying anxiety is either fear or being in a situation that you can't control or both? Well, you know, I've done a lot of thinking about that topic in general, about sort of where it comes from, what it's all about. Um, and I've heard it over and over from some of my mentors, uh, one of them being Dr. Joe Dispenza, who talks about this uh, quite a bit. But anxiety truly is this fear of the unknown, false evidence appearing real. Uh, you're, you're, you're anxious about uncertainty. And that's why it's so bad as of late, because it's always about the uncertainty about what's to come. When you look about things look at things that have happened in your past or generally things that you regret or things that have happened that have caused you problems. Usually looking at the past leads to more of a depressive feeling. You're regretful or you're starting to feel depressive thoughts. But thinking about the future or thinking about things that are unresolved 
that usually creates anxiety. And so for me, I realized it's all about uncertainty. It's all about things that you can't control. And 99.9% of them never happen. Uh, you know, if you look at almost all the things that you've been nervous about in your life, very few of them have happened or been as bad as you thought they were. So it's really an inappropriate response. I mean, the fight or flight response that you talked about, that was designed so that we could escape a bear chasing us into a cave. But by the time we got into the cave, all the blood that had rushed to our muscles had been taken away from our digestive system, had been taken away from our immune system, had been taken away from even maybe making logical decisions because it didn't matter in that moment. You needed to get away from the bear. But as soon as you got into the cave, then the blood flow should have gone back to all those other parts and the fight or flight response should be shut off. However, we're now being put into this fight or flight by our boss yelling at us or our spouse uh, having a disagreement or having some type of issue with friends or walking down Main Street and having lights and sounds and sirens and everything coming at you. And so we weren't designed for this type of stress. And so it is an inappropriate uh, trigger that's constantly leaving people in this high stress and what we call high beta waves in your brain on high alert all the time. And your brain's job is to keep you alive. So your brain is always scanning your environment for problems. And now those problems aren't just, is a bear chasing me? It's, oh my God, did I return all my emails? Or did this person say something about me that's going to affect my life or, or what have you? And so it is, a, it is a challenge now to take this super powered stress fight or flight response. And now you have to have tools. Most of us aren't taught tools as a child, um, you know, in grade two or three. We learn about dinosaurs. We learn about, you know, how to write. We learn about letters and alphabet and all of that. But how much do we learn about how to take care of our emotional state? That just isn't taught. I mean, I, I start talking to kids and especially my kids since they were really young and kids get it. And you can teach this stuff to kids much easier than adults because there's no preconception. They're not worried about how they look. They'll practice a happy emotion. They'll just look in front of a mirror and start laughing because you ask them to. Whereas if I asked an adult, just spend five minutes in front of the mirror today so that you get the muscles that stimulate um, some happy chemicals in the brain, get those firing up. Most adults are too embarrassed to do some of the things that would actually help them. Kids don't have that. And so for me, it, it, it's these, this is where we should be starting these teachings is as young as possible so that emotional self-regulation is something that is mainstream. From listening you talk, I feel like your life was the perfect storm for anxiety because going through chiropractic school is hard enough, but then it also seems like you're an adrenaline junkie that likes to do cliff, cliff climbing. Do you, have you changed your life in that way where you've, you know, reanalyzed your life and said, okay, I don't need to be doing all these adrenaline activities? Well, I, I understood this for a long time, this, why I did these, all these adrenaline junky things. And it was actually opposite for most people because most people want to feel that adrenaline. They want to feel that, that arousal, but for me, I was feeling that arousal anyways. I was feeling anxiety. So the, the anxiety that people got before jumping out of an airplane, for me, that was the same anxiety I, I had maybe about going out the night before. So the, the anxiety around these really extreme sports, that didn't bother me. The reason I did these things is because they put you in the moment. And the only place that I don't feel or I didn't feel anxiety was in the moment. So if I was scuba diving, you had to pay attention. It was all visual. It was quiet. It was visual, but you had to pay attention. And I was in the moment when I was skiing down a mountain or jumping off a cliff or doing, you know, uh, hang gliding or whatever it was, I was in the moment. And in those moments, I didn't feel anxiety. All I, all I did was experience the moment. And that was very powerful for me. So although now I don't need to do that as much because I have other ways of getting into the moment, I still do enjoy that. I mean, I'm going skiing in uh, a few weeks out West uh, in Canada so that I can hopefully get some powder and ski some powder in the mountains, but it's now not so much um, 
desperation to be in the moment. It's, I love these things because I still love being in the moment. I, that still is my happy place where you are very much engaged in what you're doing. Um, and for me though, that could be also with patience. You know, there were times that I was uh, in my room with no patience, feeling anxious beyond belief. But then as soon as someone came in, not just that had a quick adjustment, but someone that I engaged with, someone that we started talking about their life, and I, I was looking at how I could help them. Being in the moment helped me just as much as it did them. And so sort of being a health practitioner was, uh, was very selfish in some ways, because as I was helping people heal, I was helping myself heal, and I was in a much more peaceful state. And so really for me, uh, I guess to answer your question, it was always about putting myself in the moment and anything that would do that was something that I would, I would strive to do. Can you give my audience any tips for handling their own anxieties? Sure. Uh, I, I mean, the first thing is when you are feeling anxious, um, it is not the time to be making a decision. It's not the time to be making, you know, uh, your, your best, doing your best work. The first thing that you should be striving to do is get into a more coherent state. So for instance, I've had times um, during the pandemic where anxiety would be bad. Maybe I had some bad news about something and I developed, I, I, I gave it a term in the book. I call it fight or flight Zen. And what it is, it's that little voice. Some people call it intuition. It's just a voice that talks to me when I'm in a state and it's telling me to do all the good things that would be good in that moment. So I might be sitting there with anxiety at a level 10, but that voice is saying, okay, I know you're freaking out right now, but how about go take a shower? Or you know what? You really haven't eaten today and your blood sugar is a little low. You know that that creates a little bit more anxiety. So go eat something and then we'll revisit this or uh, go speak to whoever it is that you know, you feel that you might resonate with in that moment. And so the idea was I've got this little voice I listen to that is telling me to do whatever I can to get into a more coherent state in the moment. And for some people, that's literally just pausing and taking a breath because a very simple breathing technique, most people who are stressed out are chest breathers and they just heave their chest and they do very short breaths. But there's a concept that HeartMath came up with uh, or did research on, they didn't come up with the concept, but they did research on called heart rate variability. Heart rate variability, HRV, is about how your heart rhythm changes. And so when you breathe in, your heart rhythm will go up. It stimulates uh, the stress response. When you breathe out, it uses the parasympathetic system, which is your relaxation response and your heart rhythm gets slower. So when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. When you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. The difference is called your heart rate variability. And the greater your heart rate variability, the greater adaptability you have to life, the more uh, resilient you are. And in fact, they've done studies that show the longer you live, uh, the greater your HRV. But when you look at people who are chest breathers and they're kind of doing this short breaths, their HRV might be two or three or four, and it's a jagged peak if you looked at it on a heart uh, monitor. But when you start to regulate your breathing simply by breathing in through your nose for about five seconds and out through your pursed lips for about five seconds. So it looks something like this. I usually put my hand here so that my chest doesn't go anywhere. And I put my other hand on my stomach so that I could feel my stomach blowing up like a balloon. And I just take a breath in through my nose And I'm breathing out through pursed lips. And it's important to do roughly five seconds in and five seconds out. And I visualize a sine wave where you're breathing in and then you're breathing out and then you're breathing in and you're breathing out. And if that sine wave is about five seconds in, five seconds out, you start to change your heart rate variability. And after even just a minute or two of just that, forget about the rest of the technique. You're more centered, you're more relaxed, and you're better able to take or make a better decision. And so I encourage people, if they feel that they're stressed or they're anxious or there's anything, just pause, take a minute, say, okay, I'm stressed out, and take five or six breaths that are five seconds in, five seconds out. Breathe in through your heart, just visualize the air, oxygen going in and out through your heart, 
and you will find that you will reach a level of calmness that you didn't have before. And so I think that's a very valuable technique for anybody that's feeling overwhelmed is just to pause, do that stomach breathing, and then see where you're at and then reevaluate your situation. What's the significance of breathing out through your mouth and with pursed lips? Well, it allows you to, um, if you don't have your pursed lips, it just all comes out. But you want to create this five second in, five second out. And in fact, you may even want to elongate the, the uh, out breath. The reason being, if you, if you think about what I'd said uh, just a minute ago, when you breathe in, that's part of your sympathetic system and it actually stimulates the stress response. But when you breathe out, your heart rhythm goes down, you're stimulating the parasympathetic system, which relaxate, relaxes your body. And so you can even extend it and do what I would call 4-8 breathing, which is a longer extended out breath. The idea is to stimulate the relaxation response in your body. But when I just do a 5-5, five, five, it's just simply because it's a good rhythm and I can visualize a sine wave. And what that does is it just it helps to relax and get your, your heart rhythm into a strong, repetitive uh, baseline uh, as opposed to being jagged. So um, when you do that, I find if you're breathing in and out through your mouth, you're not able to guide that rhythm as well. Um, and there's much more uh, when you breathe in, there's little cilia, little things in your nose that filter the oxygen. So I'd much rather you breathing in through your nose. But the pursed lips is so that you can have a nice elongated uh, out breath that you can start to change your heart rate variability. You won't have a very good time of it if you just let the breath go and you don't do it through pursed lips. Can you share with us some case histories of people who have used your techniques? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we did uh, the beta course for our uh, coherence revolution. We did it over the summer and I put uh, quite a few people through the experience and you know, it was really just amazing to see because I wanted to have a good um, a good group of people that, you know, were uh, representative of my whole community. So we had women and men uh, ranging from 25 years old to 65 years old. Um, and the, the responses sort of were similar throughout, but depending upon the life. So there was three people that I, I, I often talk about because they sort of represent three different groups. One was a, a female in her um, late 20s, early 30s, and she was single. She didn't really have a good idea of how to put her life together. In other words, she was always chasing her tail. There was always something going on. She was always behind. Her schedule was never, uh, she could never really get on top of it. So she had no time for anything. She was always just busy doing her chores. And so part of what we do in the course is we, we encourage you to design a life that has everything in it that you want, all of your priorities, whether it's uh, your work, whether it's your social time, whether it's reading, whether it's writing, photography, painting, whatever it is you want included in your life, we want you to put together a schedule that includes that. And so by doing that and then learning the techniques, mainly heart math, um, what she reported afterwards is that she finally had time for everything in her life. And that was so powerful for her because she was now socializing at least once a week. She was finally reading at least twice a week. She was seeing some friends that she hadn't seen in a while and she was still getting her laundry done and she was still getting all of her groceries done. And for her, it was about creating a process that she could live by. When it came to heart math, what she felt is that her life had been um, just on overwhelm all the time. And so she wasn't making good decisions. And the one thing that heart math provided her was the ability to make a better decision. And I thought that was just hugely powerful that uh, she reported that. Um, the second person that I like to talk about was a woman in her 40s. And she was a typical mom who worked and cooked and did everything at home and really had no help. Uh, and not only did she have no help, she felt weak if she were to ask for help. And so for her, what the Coherence Revolution did for her was she put some time in her day for her. She did the heart math. She did. She wanted to listen to music. She wanted to paint. And so she put a few things into her life. And the most important thing she did was she got her family on board and she asked for help. And so what, after going through the Coherence Revolution, 
what she found is that three days a week, her husband was making dinner. Two days a week, her kids were making dinner. It only left her with two nights a week that she had to cover dinner. Um, and she had much more time on her hands and she felt more supported at home. And so, again, her life changed simply because she organized herself and had some tools. Um, the other one that I really thought was impactful was a guy in his 40s. He owns his own electrical company. He's in a period of growth where literally his work is outpacing the amount of employees he had. And things were growing at the same time as they were imploding because he had some unhappy workers and he had some issues at home with his wife and his kids and all kinds of stuff. So he went through the course and he was not uh, a person that I would have expected to get into meditation or heart math or any of the concepts about emotional self-regulation. I just didn't, you know, on the cover of it or the surface of it, I didn't think he was that kind of person. But he went through the course. And I think at the beginning, he did it as a favor to me because I had asked him if he'd like to be a part of the course. But about halfway through the course, he came to me and he just said, I didn't expect this, but I'm seeing all kinds of changes because with heart math, there's one technique that teaches you how to listen and really listen while you're calming yourself. And so he came up with three new initiatives at work to help his employees. Uh, he got him and his wife into therapy. He got his kids doing activities that they would never do. And so what he came to me and he said, I just never expected these type of changes simply by allowing myself to create a life that felt more coherent to me. And so what I'm seeing is across the board, whether it's a man in his 40s or women in their 60s or women in their 20s and 30s, once you develop a process and have a toolbox, you start to feel more resilient about your life. You feel that it's not as overwhelming and you feel that you've taken back control. And so in all these three different cases, really these people have control now, or at least perceived control. There's not as much uncertainty in their life. And to me, that that's everything. And, um, you know, the, they're, they're still involved with the coherence revolution and still going through because what I advise people is to keep going, keep, keep delving into these uh, concepts, keep learning and keep adapting your life uh, to make it better. You mentioned earlier that one of your mentors is Dr. Joe Dispenza. What do you offer that is different from what he's offering? It's a good question. Um, you know, me and my wife were, I mean, just avidly uh, avid fans. We did four or five um, week long events with him uh, and, you know, meditating in a group of a thousand people is just overwhelming. But the one thing that we find and, you know, on the Facebook groups or on social circles, people would come home from these week long events. And what would happen is they would now want to be doing the work and the work was the meditation, but they, people have a hard time incorporating this into their life. And what coherence revolution does is it builds upon his concept of anxiety being an addiction. And it builds upon his concepts of um, creating new neurological patterns in your, in your nervous system. But I take it a step further to give you time and a, a framework to practice the emotional state you want to feel. It's really about taking the knowledge and some of the concepts and saying, how can we literally introduce this into our lives and practice them? And so, Although some of the work is based upon Dr. Joe, most of it is just taking heart math and, and the concepts that I learned by becoming a certified trainer of heart math and saying, how else can we create coherence? Yes, you can use your breath. Yes, you can use emotion and visualization. But how else can we use the world around us? Right? Is it valuable to people to know that when you walk down the street, a busy, busy main street, that the buildings and all the lights, that produces a state in your brain that creates stress. So if you're gonna take a 20 minute walk, wouldn't it be helpful for you to learn that walking in the park is gonna put your brain into alpha and that's gonna allow the brain to be in a more healthy healing state. And so if you're gonna be doing that 20 minute walk, wouldn't it benefit you from doing it in the proper place so that you're actually getting the benefit out of it? And so what my course allows you to do is to dive into each of these and get coaching and get support on each aspect of your life so that you can design a process for you. And so I, I believe I do take concepts from 
HeartMath, Dr. Joe, um, also uh, Bruce Lipton, who did the biology of belief and how we can change our subconscious beliefs. These are all powerful concepts, but I think what, what is needed is, is like Cohen's Revolution, the course that I put together, is taking some of these gurus and some of these brilliant people and saying, okay, but how do we utilize this in our daily life? And how do we create a process for me that now I can go out and, and utilize these concepts? Uh, and I think that's what we've done. Yeah, it sounds like that yours is more based on your heart math, where his is more based on meditation. Well, I would say it on a very basic level, that's very true. Um, he is very much about specific types of meditation and how to train your brain. Um, and so, you know, there are, I talk about a little bit of his stuff in the course, but I, I don't teach his stuff simply because that's his uh, meditation stuff to teach. Uh, but I definitely recommend it. And, you know, when, when I talk about in uh, the coherence revolution about having tools, uh, there's no better tool that I use than my daily meditations. Um, and it was really powerful for me that when I went to um, his first or second uh, in-person workshop, he had a, um, a band of researchers, a team of researchers from Germany at the time who were using heart math, uh, who were sort of associated with heart math, and they were doing research on the brain as he was teaching his meditation. And so it was really cool to see how he was using heart math uh, and some of their scientists and some of their research to forward his work. And so it really just, all of it resonated with me. I felt like, okay, I'm in the right place here. I'm creating this, I'm creating a good thing here that's using some really reputable sources, simply because as soon as meditation became not just a philosophical thing to do, but a scientific researched thing, you've now got people who maybe before were on the fence about joining in or being a participant, now are saying, oh, you know what? I, I see the validation. And that's what it did for me. Heart math was validated by Dr. Joe's work simply because I looked at all the research he was doing. And so I felt, you know what? Great. I'm in a, I'm in a good place here to be teaching this uh, because there's a good scientific fa foundation for it. I think it's really awesome that you had that device on your ear that measured your brain wave and told you that you were. It measured in, your heart rate, heart rhythm, your yeah, heart rhythm. There you go. That told you you were in coherence. Is that something that's part of your course or something that's easy for someone to acquire? Yeah. Well, a anybody can get that technology. You can go to HeartMath uh, and get that. Um, in our course, I've developed a relationship with uh, with HeartMath, and we have um, a page in the back end when you become a member, and we have affiliate links. So you can click on the affiliate link and get a discount for any of their products, uh, whether it's a book or whether it's a biofeedback technology, because they do have biofeedback for computer, for uh, mobile phones, and, and that type of thing. Um, and as I said, I've, I've had their, their technology since probably about uh, 2005, 2006. Um, and I've used it on and off. Uh, but I found that when I started learning from a coach, uh, heart math, I finally got it. And not that you can't do it on your own, but I certainly uh, had a much better understanding once I was able to go through some of the training. So you have the book and you have the course. What is the difference of using one versus the other? Well, the book is really a companion to the course. Uh, I Everything that I write about in the course, I dig into in everything I write about in the book, I dig into in the course. But the book doesn't teach heart math. The, the book mentions heart math. Um, the book mentions some of the worksheets, but you're not given the workbook to actually um, deal with. It talks about practicing emotions but you're not getting the breakout rooms so that you can actually practice these things. So really the, the, the course is the practi practical aspect to the book. Uh, the book outlines it. And I think that's why when you, um, when you sign up for the course, you get the book uh, because I want you to read the book along with the course. Uh, and it kind of makes sense as you do that. You can certainly read the book without doing the course. Um, however, you're certainly not getting into all of the, um, the concepts as deep and you're not diving into it, you're not getting the coaching and you're not getting the time to practice these things um, and have people that are holding you accountable and, and a, a group of people who are all in the same 
the same mission as you, you know, have the same goals, which I think is really powerful. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't even aware of how powerful that was until I started um, hosting the beta groups because the people that showed up um, in my office to get adjusted were now they were showing up to these Zoom calls and just the, the way they interacted with other people and the way they dove into the work and practicing different emotional states. And, you know, there's one exercise where I just want you to feel the power of words. And, you know, so they're sitting there looking at another person after giving permission and they're looking them in the eye and they're saying, you know, I love you. And then they feel how that feels in their cells. And then they look at someone and they say, I hate you. And they feel it in their cells. And, you know, it's just a matter of getting a, a, a hands-on experience of what does coherence feel like and how can you achieve it? And what are the things that are depleting you on a daily basis? And how does that feel? And so the course gives you that framework and allows you to dive into these concepts, uh, whereas the book mentions them. So re really the book goes with the course, uh, but for people who want to make a change and want to dive in and, and, and make a change to their life, uh, the course is for them. All right. Well, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open sure. to that? And if so, how can they reach you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's a couple ways. Uh, on the website, if you have any questions, my email is right on the contest, contact us page. It's support at coherencerevolution.com. But for anybody listening to this podcast, you know, I wanted to give you an opportunity to read the book uh, and take the course. So um, there is a special page that we have. It's www.coherencerevolution.com forward slash 2022. And if you go there, coherencerevolution.com forward slash 2022, there'll be a code that you can download a free ebook so you can read the ebook for free. Uh, and there's also a code for 50% off of the course. So if you'd like to take the course, I, I encourage you to take advantage of the 50% off special. You can also, if you happen to be driving or don't have any uh, devices with you, if you text the word coherence to 647-955-7411. That's text the word coherence to 647-955-7411. They'll also send you a link and you can get a free ebook and you can get 50% uh, off the course uh, or the workbook or both. Um, yeah, so I really, I really hope people do take advantage of it. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to correspond with whoever. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook at um, Coherence Revolution Community. You also have a YouTube channel, correct? Yes, I believe that's just under Coherence Revolution as well, yes. What kind of content are you producing there? Well, there's eventually there's going to be uh, many more videos and podcasts. Right now, it's just a whole bunch of videos that we put together for, uh, for the Coherence Revolution and some testimonials about people that have gone through the process. Um, so that's there now. Uh, but in the future, we're going to be doing... Um, more live uh, Facebook live stuff. And then we're going to be doing some YouTube live stuff. And so that's all being created as we speak. It's uh, this has been a large, uh, a big undertaking and adventure. And it's just really exciting to see it all start taking off. All right. Well, before we finish up, can you give us one last positive message? Well, I, I think I'm living proof that um, you don't have to live in a state of anxiety and overwhelm uh, and simply using your breath can change your whole world. Um, and for anybody out there that just doesn't feel that or has never felt that, take a minute to do the breath work I was talking about, to do a few breaths through your stomach uh, and you know, in through your nose and out through some pursed lips. See how your body responds because we can use the world around us and we can use our own breath to change our physiological state. And I know firsthand that uh, I suffered for many years. And it, when I say suffered, it was hours and days at a time with with unrelenting anxiety uh, and it just doesn't have to be the case and so uh, if you can use me as an example and someone perhaps um, to give you inspiration that it's possible that's wonderful and if you're someone who isn't debilitated you're really just looking to improve your life well there's lots of things that you can do on a daily basis to create a process for yourself that will keep you inspired on a daily life you don't have to be suffering if, if all you want to do is is be inspired well, this is also for you because we just talk about how to make your life uh, more resonant with you and be able to create more um, inspiration in your life. So 
uh, I encourage everybody to, to check out the Coherence Revolution and, uh, and join us. Well, Dr. Halpern, thank you so much for joining me today. I really thank appreciate you. you. I wish you the best and I wish you massive success with your course and your book. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.